Okay, so now we have Charlotte. Yep. This is uh, your research design, right? Yes, that's right. Um, thank you everyone for sticking around uh, on this Friday afternoon to listen to my research proposal presentation. Um, broadly, my research looks at the impact of geopolitical and geocultural events on the movement of antiquities. Specifically, I'm looking at the potential reconfiguration of the market for Southeast Asian antiquities in the context of the revival of the Maritime Silk Road for the Belt and Road Initiative. I'll start with giving a little bit of context uh, into antiquities trafficking in Southeast Asia and how it's been researched. It's been framed as a legacy of the European colonial era. So, you know, starting with um, excavations and looting by colonial officials and then moving on into the 20th century in less official, shall we say, um, uh, looting. Uh, as a result, it's been understood as an East to West movement. And in this um, conceptualization, Asian countries are understood as sources to be exploited for a market in the West that um, largely centers around cities like London, New York, Paris. It's also been understood in the context of the region's historiography and history of archeology. span so it's focused a lot on the national and the monumental and on land sites. And we see this reflected when the objects hit the market um, and, and the same kind of terms are used to describe them. So here there's a catalog from Sotheby's that just calls it Southeast Asian art, um, where you'll see things like Indonesian sculptures, Khmer antiquities, Vietnamese pottery. And so the research in trafficking has also um, reflected this and taken a national approach or it's focused on um, specific types of artifacts from specific eras or places. So that's Sorry, yeah. uh, would you like to make it as a slideshow? Oh, is it not a slideshow? No, it's not a slideshow. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's a so uh, what are you seeing now? The slide. Okay, good, because I can still see my notes. Okay. <laughs> right. so, um, where was I? So, right, antiquities trafficking uh, understood in the context of historiography. So a lot of land-based stuff, a lot of monumental um, objects and, and that kind of stuff. Um, but that's not to say that we weren't seeing any stuff related to uh, maritime. This is an example from uh, the Geldermassen. Um, shipwreck, which was salvaged in the 80s and ended up uh, at auction in, in um, Amsterdam. And it was really successful auction and possibly the first uh, auction of shipwreck ceramics to make a profit. And around this time in the 80s and 90s, there's a, a growing interest in maritime histories and maritime archaeology. And that's really accelerated in the last decade. And I think that that can be explained through the revival of the Maritime Silk Road for the Belt and Road Initiative which is um, China's major transnational infrastructure project. It's widely understood as a geopolitical strategy, but the thing that really interests me in this is that um, it, it uses a lot of, um, of cultural developments and cultural forces in it. In particular in Southeast Asia, it's using the Maritime Silk Road, which is a constructed history. It's an ambiguous, very vast historical geographical concept that actually starts gaining currency in the second half of the 20th century. And it, it, it's useful um, today in the context of the Belt and Road Initiative because it foregrounds ideas of trade and connectivity, peace, prosperity, and implies deep historical friendships between China and the rest of the world. So it's, it's been a really powerful diplomatic tool um, and a tool to promote and support the Belt and Road Initiative because it, it gets potential partners to buy into an idea of a shared past and a shared future. So on the back of this, we're seeing a lot of cultural sector development that, that's using this Maritime Silk Road, um, particularly in the museum sector and in um, increasing maritime archaeology projects um, that are oftentimes, um, a, a lot of them are collaboratives and, and we see China leading these projects or funding them or organizing them. So this interest in the maritime, the development of the Maritime Silk Road and the rise of China, it, it means that the conceptualization of antiquities trafficking that I talked about earlier as this East to West movement doesn't really fit anymore. 
Um, first of all, because we have objects that can't really be talked about in terms of the national anymore. Um, also because uh, we see cities like Shanghai and Hong Kong that are becoming major art hubs and um, destinations now for, for antiquities from Southeast Asia. So this is all raising a lot of really interesting questions that I wanna explore regarding um, value and the consumption and circulation of antiquities in cultural, commercial, and political contexts. So within the, with the Maritime Silk Road um, becoming this political tool that's working, that's playing out in cultural institutions, I'm really interested in the role of the state and, um, and, and the role of these institutions in shaping value, in creating new forms of demand, in engendering new movements of objects. So my research then has three aims. Uh, the first is to understand how the revival of the Maritime Silk Road drives antiquities trafficking. And to do this, I'm conceptualizing the Maritime Silk Road as a cultural field. And so this is my second aim. And my final aim is to develop new understandings of how geopolitical events shape antiquities trafficking. So like I said, um, I wanna conceptualize the Maritime Silk Road as a field of cultural projection. So I'm looking at obviously Pierre Bourdieu, um, because it allows me to address a lot of issues in the production of, um, of antiquities. So he, uh, Bourdieu looks at art as a um, social and cultural production rather than an aesthetic one. And he looks at the ways that a number of, of resources, whether that be uh, institutional, expert, critical, commercial, um, get, you, get mobilized to create the symbolic meanings that assigns the value to objects that make them quote unquote art. Um, through this approach, he is able to examine the structures that are underlying the relationships between the actors who are mobilizing these resources. And these actors include artists, but also museums, galleries, critics, academics. And he does all this. In doing this, he's able to answer questions regarding the role of scholarship and, this, and, and the role of the state in the production of art. And I found this really interesting, uh, really useful in studying antiquities trafficking to understand how objects get folded into um, regimes of significance and how this may work as a driver for trafficking uh, antiquities because it creates demand for certain objects. It also brought in my understanding of antiquities trafficking to look beyond the role of um, looters, smugglers, and dealers to include museums, academia, the state, um, the wider art market, cultural policy, etc. So because of this, I'm looking across three, three disciplines which are um, critical heritage studies, material culture studies, and criminology. And within all of these, I'm looking at um, ideas around the creation and the circulation of value and how um, certain labels get ascribed to objects as archeological or as art or part of the Maritime Silk Road, but also as illicit or licit. In addition to this, I'm also looking at how this construction of value, the circulation of value with regard to heritage relates to questions of power and diplomacy, specifically in the context of the Belt and Road Initiative. So power and diplomacy, these are issues that are central to critical heritage studies, which looks at, um, which, yeah, looks at constructed histories like the Maritime Silk Road. It looks at the appropriation of the past and its relationship to power. So working within this, um, with, within this discipline allows me to critically assess how the Maritime Silk Road is getting constructed um, and how it's getting embedded in politics and geopolitics. I'm, I see it as, an, as a new space for heritage making that goes beyond the nation. It's creating um, or promoting a transnational history that it seems various group, quote unquote, along the Maritime Silk Road can identify with um, and in, because of this, it needs to be read critically in terms of, of power and geopolitical power, along with how it's shifting um, how we understand heritage or certain heritage. So because the Maritime Silk Road and actually a lot of maritime heritage in general deals with ideas of transnational connectivities and, and trade, um, I'm looking at geocultural thinking to answer these questions that are raised by taking a critical heritage approach. So I'm uh, using the works of people like Tim Winter and Ulf Henrichs to explore this. Um, 
Hannertz in particular, he describes the geocultural as a map making process um, that provides people with easily visualized and understandable representations of the world um, by distributing things cultural um, across space. He also looks at how these representations get circulated through this, the diffusion of culture. And he links this to ideas of soft power. And then Winter expanded on this um, in the context of the Belt and Road Initiative by looking at the, by arguing that the Silk Road and the Maritime Silk Road are geocultural concepts in order to really highlight their geopolitical value. And so he demonstrated in this way that China is accumulating geocultural power through the use of Silk Road heritage, um, in part by supporting or um, leading cultural sector developments in Belt and Road partner countries. And like I said earlier, these developments often take the form of um, collaborations between museums and, um, but also in archeology. span So objects are being moved and exchanged in, in new ways in this region. Uh, this is a, an example from, um, from this year of one of these projects that's uh, an, an exchange program between Singapore and China involving three museums, the Asian Civilization Museum, the Shanghai Museum and the Palace Museum in, in Beijing. These kinds of projects, the collaborative projects and this focus on, on movable material culture in the Maritime Silk Road rather than um, sites or monuments has really highlighted to me the role of, of museums in, um, in the construction of historical narrative and in the way that they present them to the, to the public. But it's also really um, highlighted their, the place of museums in international affairs. So I'm looking at some work in uh, material culture studies and particularly Tony Bennett's work on um, imperial museums to go beyond just analyzing display practices and exhibition narratives um, and focus on the movement of objects across cultural institutions through these collaborations and how they get brought together into new assemblages and create new meanings. He, uh, Bennett conceptualizes colonial museums as uh, centers of calculation, as opposed to uh, sites of collections, which are, are the colonies. And he uses this um, to demonstrate how cultural objects in the context of the museum and in the context of this scientific movement participate in political projects. In, in his case, he's looking at empire. So what I found really interesting in his work is the way that he analyzes the movement of objects from site to uh, from the site of collection in the colony to the metropole where the museum or the center of calculation is and how this affects how the objects are understood and valued, but also reveals um, the geographies of knowledge and power of the, of the time. So he does draw a little bit on, on Bruno Latour's work. And so I, I wanna explore this a little bit more, explore um, actor network theory and also possibly Ian Hodder's work in entanglement to further um, explore this movement and reassembling of, all, of, of objects in cultural institutions in Asia um, to address how the geographies of knowledge and power may be changing in the context of the Maritime Silk Road. I think it could also be an interesting um, approach to understanding the shifting geographies of the art market and eventually understanding um, new forms of antiquities trafficking. So this leads me to my, my last field, which is criminology. Um, so criminology theories explain criminal behavior and crimes themselves. And my interest here is in the role of the art market and cultural institutions like museums in legitimizing illicit objects. By illicit objects, I mean objects that um, were excavated and exported without permits or under dubious circumstances um, that have to appear legitimate once they hit the market for legal reasons, because no one wants to get caught, but also because it actually adds value to the object. Um, there's been some research that's shown that there's a correlation between provenance and price realized. So provenance is the history of ownership of an object. And there are a few that I've listed here. The one that um, is um, circled there is a really good one because it also includes uh, exhibitions and literature. So the object has been in, uh, in certain uh, museums and cultural institutions and there's been research done about it. So the more of this information there is, the more detailed it is, apparently the, the more um, money the object gets on the market. This research has also shown that 
the provenance information actually isn't common. Um, and when it is there, it's a lot of it's faked or um, it's super vague, vague enough that it's questionable. So there's another example here, um, which is, it just says private English collection acquired prior to 1999, which really doesn't tell us very much about where the object came from. So there are a few criminology theories that I want to explore um, to address the practices and policies of auction houses regarding how they collect and present provenance. So these are cultural criminology, rational choice, and uh, rational choice theory, and social constructivism. So cultural criminology looks at the environment in which a crime occurs um, and the social and cultural forces that shape criminal behavior. So it's really concerned with um, meaning, symbolic interactions, status, signals, images, and it seems to align a lot with uh, Bulgia's field theory in a way that's, that could be really interesting. Um, and I need to dig into that a little bit more. Rational choice theory looks at um, motivation and assumes that people make choices based on maximizing profit and minimizing loss. Uh, finally, social constructivism addresses how criminal behavior yeah. is normalized. Um, and that, that could also be a really interesting approach to um, understanding the choice that auction that, that go into um, listing provenance and how it's listed. So I'm still kind of working through the criminology uh, angle of this thesis, but I think there's some really interesting overlap with the critical heritage approach and the material culture approach, because they all kind of address how certain values or labels as um, historical or aesthetic, political, legitimate, how all of these get ascribed to objects through movement and through interaction with cultural institutions. So in working across these three disciplines, um, I decided that my methodology is such that my um, data is gonna be gathered mostly from discourse and text analysis from the art market, museum and scholarship. And I'll, I'll, I, I will be trying to um, supplement this with interviews with professionals from those fields, um, but mostly I'll be looking at things like exhibition catalogs and marketing material auction catalogs, museum reports, um, any output from archeology span projects, media studies, policy documents, that kind of stuff. Um, I think uh, from this data, I can track how the historical narrative is presented to the public. Um, and I can also see any changes in uh, trends in the market and market conditions. I, and all of that I think would be uh, good indicators of firstly, how the Maritime Silk Road is getting constructed um, and what the impact of that construction is on the market and on um, antiquities from Southeast Asia. One of the things that I want to uh, examine closely is uh, any publication and provenance information that's available in auction catalogs and exhibition catalogs as well sometimes, uh, which is useful in tracking the movement of objects across the market or at the very least it would show me what the preferred trajectory, I guess, of these objects is. Um, and so surveying what provenance is available, how it's presented and like linking that to how much money it's made and, and which cultural institutions get listed in the provenance would provide um, in, insight into questions about value, prestige, um, that kind of stuff and allow me to um, look at laundering as a cultural process. So finally, I just wanna talk about the contribution of my research. First, it uh, addresses the changing nature of the antiquities market in the 21st century and its relationship to geopolitical events. So like I said earlier, the previous conceptualization of Asian antiquities trafficking doesn't really fit anymore. Um, and it's still really important and informs my research because it, it highlights the power imbalances that exist in, in the antiquities market, but it doesn't quite reflect what's the, like the current social cultural political landscape of Asia. And so my study uh, addresses this gap by looking at the impact of the Belt and Road Initiative and in particular, its cultural development on um, the movement of Asian antiquities. My second contribution is to uh, discussions on geocultural thinking, specifically on the role of material culture in geocultural thinking. Um, I'm, I'm looking at how and to what end objects are getting folded into 
um, the story of the Maritime Silk Road into new political economies of scholarship, expertise, prestige that are associated with the Maritime Silk Road. And so this adds uh, to the, the, the cultural debates in, the, in um, debates about the, the Belt and Road Initiative. So finally, in doing so, um, my research is also bringing issues relating to maritime archaeology and underwater cultural heritage into critical heritage studies. So in interrogating the way that underwater cultural heritage participates in the accumulation of power in the 21st century, my research is looking more critically at the role of maritime archaeology in international affairs beyond the usual questions of um, jurisdiction and ownership. So that's the end of my presentation with a few technical difficulties. Uh, thanks for listening and I'd really, really appreciate any feedback you have um, on this. Let me stop sharing now. Thank you, Charlotte. That's really great. And yeah, I mean, like, and you were really, really cool <laughs> at that time. Because of this issue, that's great. Um, I think we yeah, have to it out. <laughs> I think we have one question from Ian. It's on the chat. Um, let me see. Oh, do you want me to read it? Oh, Ian. Yes. Is the less rigor of establishing the provenance of donated objects to institutions, to items they purchase from uh, their own funds, any indication of the movement of artifacts, historical objects from periods prior to the entry of Europeans to Asia? Um, that's actually a really good question. Uh, the first part, um, I don't know the answer to, and that would certainly be something that um, would be great to explore in, um, in my research. How, because provenance is not is listed even less often in exhibition catalogs than it is in, in auction catalogs. Um, so that would be uh, an interesting question. I'll make a note of that and, and um, fold that into my research. The second one, indication of movement of artifacts, historical objects from pre periods prior to the entry of Europeans to Asia. Um, I don't know. I'm sure there was, um, and there probably are completely different values attached to it. I, it wouldn't be, framed in terms of antiquities trafficking, um, probably. Yeah, I hope that answered um, your questions a little bit. Oh, we have Sam. Uh, thanks, thanks, Charlotte. That was really interesting. Um, I just wanted to ask whether you found that specific cities or countries are trying to angle to be the kind of big players in this game. Um, you noted Singapore and uh, Asian Civilizations Museum, uh, the National Gallery, I know are very much kind of involved with this. Are there specific players in the region that are trying to sort of be the hub for either sort of um, places where um, maritime heritage objects are displayed or where they're sort of kept or uh, evaluated, et cetera? Yeah, so um, I think there would be. I'm not entirely sure what those are yet because part of what's really interesting about this topic is that these objects are keep moving so they're they're going from institution to institution but i am seeing that a lot of the same museums are getting involved so the palace museum in beijing for example um has done six or seven um loan programs or traveling exhibition programs in the last two years um and and yeah, so there are certain institutions that are, are coming up again and again. And there's also um, like within China, there's been some directive um, for something like 12 cities or 20 cities to um, promote themselves as part of the Maritime Silk Road. And then outside of China, um, it's, I don't know how much of it is like state organized, but we are seeing, I am seeing a lot of uh, different museums like Asian Civilization Museum is the biggest one I can think of um, that are trying to get involved in this, yeah. Let me tell you right now, it, the state's somewhere in there, I'll just say that. Yeah. <laughs> Charlotte, um, you, given you're using Bordier, um, you're quite quiet about the consumer. And what's going on there, right? In terms of aesthetics, taste, consumption, and who that in this work, murky world of the illicit, who that might be. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about that in terms of whether you're thinking Southeast Asia, China, et cetera? Yeah, so it's a bit difficult to answer at this point. Um, originally, I 
did want to address that and like the the role of the rising middle class and um and in in a lot of the like art market um reports and stuff people talk about how the center of gravity of the art market is moving to china but all the discussion is about how um this is related to the fact that there are a lot more uh people with money in china who can spend that money on luxury items so i i had wanted to address that um and looking at at the collectors and buyers on uh in the art market and how the way i was going to do that was to do field work in singapore and bangkok and hong kong um at auctions and galleries and try to use that as an in to talk to um consumers so because of covid i've uh kind of scrapped that and it's also difficult because of covid the art market crashed <laughs> for a while and um there's this idea that people don't want to be seen to be spending frivolously right now um so it's a bit i think it would be difficult to find people to interview um in that context so i've i've kind of scrapped that idea but if i get a chance to do that i would love to include it as well i think from greg one of the article titles appearing on a slide in your presentation labeled the bri as an anti-imperialist discourse does any other literature analyze the maritime sick road as a new imperialist project of appropriation the seeming from different metropoles like beijing so that's actually a really interesting article um it was written by a chinese academic um and it's pushing back against a lot of the um, uh, international community discourse about how the Belt and Road Initiative is um, is neo-colonial, uh, is imperial, and is a, a, a big political, yeah, a geopolitical strategy. So actually, that article is very interesting to read because it's kind of giving the the opposite um, view of what you see a lot in in academia at the moment um there hasn't been as much yet on the um cultural dimensions of this like tim's been working on it and um ronnie and and myself now um so stay tuned i guess <laughs> yeah. if i may ask um does COVID interrupt your research design i mean you yeah like the, uh, because you started before 2020 if i'm not mistaken yeah so my research proposal got accepted two weeks after the pandemic was or the covid was declared a, a pandemic um and like i said at for a few months i wasn't sure how i would be able to do my research because of the way that it affected um, the art market and the museum sectors. So all the museums closed down, all the exhibitions were canceled, all the exchanges and collaborations that I really wanted to look at had been canceled or indefinitely postponed. And I had no idea when any of that was coming back. Um, it did come back and China is leading the pack, of course. Um, so in that sense, it did take me a while to kind of shift things around and figure out if my project was still possible and then of course the lack of field work um, and not being able to go to the exhibitions myself that was one of my plans was to to see how what objects are on display how they're they're being displayed and, and talked about and being able to um to participate in auctions not participate being like being at an auction not actually buying anything because i can't afford any of that um being there and being able to talk to um the auctioneers who organized this but also the the people who are buying stuff and, and and getting their viewpoint all of this would have been really great to do and isn't really possible to do over zoom because a lot of it is like informal discussions um so yeah it it did affect my research but um i think i figured it out in the end that's good do we have more questions and suggestions for charlotte please anyone let me go through the, no, I haven't seen any. Mm. 
Sam, again. Yeah, Sam. I'm, is it all right if I ask another one? Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to ask about value, the notion of value and valuing antiquities in art, because of course, Bourdieu's work um, is a movement away from the traditional sort of Marxist understanding of the labor theory of value, right? Yeah. Um, and of course, the art market in particular, I don't know about antiquities, it's, you know, the way that things are valued is sort of like, you know, like credit default swaps and other ways in which sort of capital operates today, very sort of um, uh, behind closed doors, uh, mm -hmm. algorithmically at, at times. Do you have a sense of how, um, like, do you, have, do you have any thoughts on value and how things are valued in particular and what mechanisms sort of are either um, uh, generated by specific political actors who have specific sorts of ideological um, uh, commitments, et cetera? Yeah. So there has been some research um, using some of Borgia's ideas um, in like uh, social and cultural capital, particularly with regards to antiquities. And um, there's one study by Dennis Byrne that's really good on um, Thai antiquities and how Thai collectors express patriotism through um, buying uh, antiquities. There's also some research, like newer new research um, on the, idea of um, just participating in the market is enough to get the that kind of capital, not just having the object and displaying it in your house, being seen to participate in the market. Um, and so those are all like really interesting questions. But like I said, I keep saying that like, I am not entirely sure how to address the, the consumption and the, the yeah, the buyer aspect, the collector aspect of this, um, the way that I, like I had started reading Bourdieu for that exact purpose, but it kind of pushed me in a direction where I was realizing that there's, there's more to antiquities than just it being a pretty object on the market. Um, there's all these other factors and that led me to looking at the other, um, the disciplines that I, that I mentioned.